We begin a worship service this morning, reading the, some verses of the Psalm 104, and I invite all of you to stand. From 31st, may the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. He who looks at the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. May my meditation be pleasing to him as I rejoice in the Lord. Amen. Your holy name, bless the 
our congregational prayer is going to be from John 5, 24, 25. You can look in your own Bibles. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. So I'll ask you guys to uh, pray that the Holy Spirit give you ears to hear the Word of God and that for belief in Christ, that you have a belief in Christ and a heart to do the Father's will and then to praise God that we who hear and obey his voice have passed from death to life. So let's take two minutes and I'll close. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word of life, Jesus Christ, Father who has taken us from death to life, who has given us eternal life. Thank you for giving us the means to believe in him and to believe in you. And we pray, Father, that you open up our ears as we receive your word this morning. We pray that it will work in our hearts that the Holy Spirit will open up our minds to understanding and to know you better, to praise you better. And Father, we thank you that uh, we can enjoy this time of fellowship right now, and we do pray that your presence will be evident, that we will know that you are here in our midst. We pray for Pastor Craig as he shares the message that you uh, grant him the power of the Holy Spirit to proclaim the good news to us. We pray this all in the name of Christ, our Lord. Amen. Here 
Amen. Please be seated. Welcome, everybody, to the Union Church of Rio de Janeiro. We are a Bible-based international church, and the song we sang and the songs we've been seeing, the message you've heard is the message that we've been proclaiming here in Rio for 136 years. Yeah, so we are Bible-based, and we're also international, which means we use English as a tool to reach out to uh, foreigners who are in the city, others who don't know Portuguese, or locals who speak English. And some are here to better their English. Uh, some are here just to get to know us, and for various reasons. Some are married to Americans or to Europeans. Uh, so we have couples this morning here and, and families from all over the world. We got uh, London, right? Or England, I should say. And we have England here, Australia, and United States. Uh, Brazil, the Philippines, so very good to have you guys here. And as a pastor, I just want to encourage you as we're worshiping the Lord in song and through the word to say, here's my heart, Lord. Take it, Lord. And the message of this morning is we're going to see why we have hope in a change and ever-changing world, at times a dismal world, um, in, in a sense, a dying world, a chaotic world, it's because of what God has done through his purpose from the beginning to prepare our hearts to say, here I am, Lord, take my heart. And um, um, so that's my prayer for each one of you this morning. Well, you can join us here. Um, normally, we have 902 Adult Bible Fellowship. That's going to resume again in February. All of our ministry leaders, even our kids' ministry leaders, are uh, resting on kind of vacation this month of January. We have a lot of people uh, traveling, taking uh, advantage of the holidays. My wife and I have been able to do that. We were up in Petropolis for five days, and some of you guys were in Terrazopolis. That was a wonderful time. We uh, really enjoyed being here through Christmas, our, our Christmas Eve service, very special Christmas, and uh, we were able to step away last week. How many of you guys were here last week? I know we had a, a group here, different people left, other people are coming, so Happy New Year to you all. If you have missed a service, you can go online and you can catch our services, our Sunday morning services. We posted by Tuesday in the morning. Uh, Tuesday at night, we have another posting of our UC University, which is our doctrinal core courses. And on Thursday, we post a devotional called Our Weekly Communion. So we encourage you to go to Facebook. 
uh, uh, if you can't make it here, you have a friend that's far away, you can tell them to log on Facebook Live, Union uh, Church Rio, and that's Sunday morning at 10. You can watch this service live, and welcome to all of you who are, uh, are here by the internet. And you can also catch that posting Tuesday. So I encourage you to go to YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, type in Union Church Rio. What's that? Your Union Church Rio. And, and many of you found us by uh, typing into Google, right? Uh, English speaking church in Rio. So that's Union Church Rio. And uh, you can catch all of our messages. Uh, this morning, we are going to be celebrating the Lord's Supper together, Holy Communion. So that's a very special time. On the first Sunday of the month, we share a hot lunch with everybody following the service. And the second Sunday of the month, we have uh, the Lord's Supper uh, together. We'll be doing that today. That'll be a special ending to our church service. Before I move on, I want to recognize Sam Sawyer. Sam had a birthday on Friday. Come on up here real quick, Sam. All right, Sam Sawyer. And we, we had also Eddie, who works here on campus. It was Eddie's birthday, too, Edgy. Uh, any other birthdays? Tomorrow is Joaquin. Come on, man. All right, Joaquin. Joaquin is going to have a special part of the service today. Yeah? Wow. So it's not only jo Joaquin's birthday, 18. No. <laughs> not 18 yet? I think no. I'm too short for that. All right, not yet. But Joaquin is going to take a, play a special role in our service this morning. We're excited about that, Annabelle. Great. Let me pray for you guys. Lord, we give you thanks as we celebrate life. We thank you that we're born once of human descent. We are sons of Adam and daughters of Eve. Uh, Lord, we give you thanks that we have an opportunity to live this life. And yet we also think that there's a second birth by the Spirit. And that's a working that only you can do. I pray you would bless Annabella, Sam, and Joachim, not only these days on their birthdays, but uh, for many more years, that you would protect them, that they would grow in their health and prosperity. But most of all, Lord, that they would know Christ's richest blessings set aside for them in the power of Christ and the Holy Spirit all the days of their life. Bless them, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Set a cat to free You live the heavy burden And even now you are leaving me There is no healing like the Lord our Maker There is no go to the King of Kings Whoa, whoa, our God is with us We will feel no evil Cause you do impossible surrounding me there you prepare a table in the presence of my enemies there is no healer like the lord our maker there is no we go to the king of kings whoa, whoa. our god is with us we will feel no evil because you do impossible Impossible things. You hear the 
broken hearted You set the captive free You lift the heavy burden And even now you will see it to me There is no healer like the Lord our Maker There is no ego to the King of Kings Whoa. He asked me not to say anything, but I'm really happy that Joaquin is serving here yeah. with us. He was already serving back there in the filming, and we have a, a big team here for all of this work. Many people you don't know, we have Nakash back there, Tasha back there. We always have a lot of people uh, working for this service to happen. And we praise the Lord because we're a small church, but He's bringing people here with a heart to the Lord to serve and adore Him, working or singing, or not singing sometimes, but with a heart to worship the Lord. From the coolness of the garden to the chaos of the fall, when he saw the Red Sea parted, Jericho's tumbling walls, love was leading us to freedom, and you were teaching us a song. Through every page of history, you write what you belong. From the beginning to the ending, you're the center of it all. It's from you, and it's from you. the promise of the prophets to the virgin birth the one who healed the blind man was a king that came to serve on the cross you were my burden took my sin down to the grave and all the Sunday morning you rolled the song
Can we hear an amen to that? All right. Who is the center of it all? Christ is the center of it all. Please be seated. Thank you, worship band. Once again, awesome. And congratulations to your newest member there. Well done, son. Very good. Well, um, like I said, we're coming off the Christmas season, and there were many, many highlights, but one of them, I'm kind of sucker for a story, get sentimental, was watching A Christmas Carol. You remember that story, A Christmas Carol, Ebenezer Scrooge? You guys have that in Portuguese as well, Ebenezer Scrooge, A Christmas Carol? Yes, no? Anyway, um, I've seen that as a movie. I've seen it as a cartoon. Some of you who are older, Mr. Magoo, you guys know Mr. Magoo, the old 60s, 70s cartoon. And even he played the part of Ebenezer Scrooge. Oh, yeah. And I've even seen it off-Broadway in New York City. What a spectacular that was. Amazing. Well, A Christmas Carol is a story about a very wealthy miser. You know what a miser is? You know, he's got a lot of money, but he's mean-spirited. He's a selfish old man. Ebenezer Scrooge hates Christmas. Bah humbug is what he says. What's there so, what, what do you have to be joyful about? Now, one cold Christmas Eve, Scrooge is cruel to his employee, Mr. Cratchit. Remember Mr. Cratchit, a very humble man, and Scrooge withholds Cratchit's meager wages. And he complains that he has to pay him on Christmas, and he's not even going to work. But he better be there at the 26th at 8 in the morning. So really tough on this guy. And, and Cratchit has a little boy. Remember what the little boy's name is? Tiny Tim. And Tiny Tim is very, very sick. And so when Scrooge withdraws his, uh, withholds his, his, his salary, he's not able to uh, take care of the sick child as he needs to. Well, then he goes on that same day, that same Christmas Eve, he refuses to give money to charity, to the poor. And finally, when he's invited to his nephew's house, his deceased sister's son, the only family that he has, he says, bah humbug, what do you have uh, to be so joyful about? You are not rich. And the nephew says, well, if wealth is the measure of our happiness on Christmas, why are you so bah humbug? You should be a lot happier, right? Well, when Scrooge gets home, he's surprised by encounters with otherworldly visitors. Do you remember this? So first he's visited by the ghost of his old business partner, Jacob Marley, right? Jacob Marley, very good. Now Marley warns him of his fate in chains if he doesn't change his miserly ways. Well, then Scrooge has three more encounters with spirits, and they are the ghost of Christmas past, the ghost of Christmas present, and the ghost of Christmas future. And during each encounter, the three ghosts take Scrooge, each in his own turn, on a journey through Christmas's past, Christmas's going on right there, present, and Christmas's that will come. Yes. In Scrooge, he sees what was, he sees what is, and he sees what is to be. And he is overwhelmed with regret, sorrow, and dreadful fear. And the final scenes of his journey to the future, he sees his own funeral, his own casket. And the casket, the kaishon, of the little boy, Tiny Tim. And shaking, he asked the ghost of Christmas future, is this what will be? Or is this what might be? Well, when he wakes up Christmas Day, he is a transformed man. He realizes that, first of all, he's not dead. Second of all, he hasn't missed Christmas at all. 
And he is full of joy and excitement about his opportunity to use his wealth to bless others on this most joyous day. So Scrooge buys the biggest turkey in the market for the Cratchit family. Sounds a little like Elias. Elias, if you know Elias, you've probably received some gift that, that you didn't expect to, to receive and uh, so generous. And so the Cratchit family gets the biggest goose in the market. And the story ends with Scrooge spending Christmas Day with his nephew and family joyfully and generously and a generosity that lasts throughout the year. Well, we're continuing our sermon series called The Whole Story of the Bible in 16 Verses. Can you imagine telling the whole story of the Bible in just 16 verses, right? And this is by uh, Chris Bruno's book by that same title. We're following that as a guide. Today we reach verse 10. We're well over halfway. Ezekiel 37 verses 3 through 5. And we're going to see, just like in the fictional story of Scrooge, the prophet Ezekiel also experiences three otherworldly encounters. But Ezekiel's encounters, they're not fictional ghosts. But he, Ezekiel will encounter the divine. God Almighty himself, three times. And through these three encounters, God will reveal his promise of salvation from death to life. Would you please stand with me as we read our text today from Ezekiel 37, verses 3 through 5. Resurrection. Promised. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. And this is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones, I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. And this is the lesson of the 10th verse of our whole story of the Bible. Would you pray with me? Lord, we just give you thanks that we can be here and hear your word. We thank you for the prophet Ezekiel. We thank you for the encounters that he had uh, with you. Would you now open our hearts, O oh Lord, that we might hear your word, O oh Lord. Would you open our hearts that we might receive through your spirit a willing heart, an understanding heart to do your will. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, we've been telling the whole story of the Bible in 16 verses. I've asked you in the very beginning, if you were to tell someone what the Bible means, how would you start? Where would you start? And this is where we've been so far. So many of you here for the first time today, we have a lot of visitors. We're going to catch up on the whole story, all right? So here's where we've been so far. Let's bring it up on the screen so you guys can see it with me. God created the kingdom, and he is the king. That's very important, okay? But he made human beings to be his representatives in that kingdom. However, Adam and Eve did what? They rejected this call, which led to death, yes. But God promised to defeat the serpent through the seed of the woman, who is also the seed of Abraham. So God promises to bless the world through Abraham's family, especially through who? Judah's royal seed, who is King David. You see how it's all connected. Next, because all people were guilty and deserved death, the sacrifices of the Mosaic 
law, the law of Moses, revealed more clearly the people's need for a substitute. And this would turn out to be ultimately the suffering servant. And today we're going to see this part of the story. Through the servant and the work of the Spirit, God would establish a new covenant, a better covenant, and give everlasting life in the place of death to his people. So it's a big turning point in the story. And last week we saw through the suffering servant a turning point that no longer animals would be needed. Animals were, were, were not so useful because it never changed human heart. So you had to keep killing these little animals and the heart never changed. So we knew we needed at one time one sacrifice for all and that's the suffering servant that we see in Isaiah. And through that suffering servant, we would see a brand new covenant and a better way to live in the presence of God. Let's take a look at this encounter number one in verses one through three. And if you have your Bible, I, I really encourage you to open it to Ezekiel. We're not going to put these verses up here. Um, and it's not in the bulletin, so you can open up your phone or your, your Bible. Ezekiel 37, 1 through 3. We're going to see this first encounter between the Son of Man, who is the son of Ad Adam, a son of Adam, which is Ezekiel the prophet, humankind, encountering with the Sovereign Lord, okay? This is the Sovereign Lord, and we're going to see a probe of the problem. What problem? The probe of the problem of death, all right? So here we go, Ezekiel 37. We're going to see this in the first three verses. The hand of the Lord was on me, said the prophet Ezekiel. Now, who was Ezekiel? I mean, it's hard to keep these guys straight, right? So, first of all, let's just take a look at our context. Ezekiel was a prophet and a priest of Israel who lived in a really chaotic time internationally, okay? So, about 150 years before, the northern tribes of Israel fell to Assyria and disappeared. They were taken captive, all right? A lot of sadness. The city then of Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, fell to the Babylonians. And that was in 612 B.C. And Nebuchadnezzar went knocking on the door of Jerusalem in stages. Finally, the walls were breached and the city fell in 586 B.C. And this is the time of Ezekiel. This is when Ezekiel was sharing his revelations, okay? Ezekiel prophesies from 593, almost 600 years before Christ, for about 20 years, down to 571 B.C. And he was talking to Jews who were also taken captive in Babylonian, Babylonia. So they were taken from Jerusalem. It'd be like someone, like the... the uh, uh, our neighbors down there, Messi and uh, Argentinians, come and take you out of Rio and back to Buenos Aires. You know, not a bad place to live, but hey, you know, you want to live here, right? So they're taken captive, and uh, these, this is the audience of Ezekiel. And his main theme was this, God's presence is the key to life. Now, I want you to repeat that with me. God's presence is the key to life. Now, we're going to try it all together. God's presence is the key to life. All right, clap your hands for yourselves. If you can remember that one phrase, that's basically the, the, the message of the, ser the, the sermon this morning, that God's presence is the key to life, all right? Now, in Ezekiel 37, 1, continuing on, we see the hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. And it was full of, what do you think this valley was full of? Bones. Dead man's bones, okay? Now, the hand of the Lord upon me, this is language that indicates this was a really heavy encounter, okay? The heavy hand of the Lord was on the prophet. It was a heavy encounter with the Almighty. 
intense. The creator ruler, the covenantal God of Israel. And it says, he brought me out by what? By the Spirit of the Lord. And this indicates that he didn't physically go out to a valley, but the Lord by the Spirit took him and he had a vision as if he was there, very vivid vision of being in the middle of a valley filled with dead man's bones. Ezekiel 37 verse 2 says this, He led me back and forth among them. So the Lord takes him back and forth for him to get a good look. And he says, I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley. Bones that were very dry. Well, what in the world does he mean by very dry bones? Okay? Very dry bones indicate that they've been there a very long time. These bones were very dead, right? Further, they're lying on the valley floor. They're not in a cavern. They're not in a tomb. These people have been killed with utter disdain and dishonor. And the bodies were left in the valley for the vultures and the animals to pick until all the sinew and the flesh and the skin was gone and they were just rotting bones, drying bones. In the end, Ezekiel 37, verse 3. This is the context of what we read. Then the Lord asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? It's a hard question. Have you ever looked and stared at bones? Here in Brazil, funerals, uh, it's, it's a... It's a, a, a it's a much more in-your-face reality death is. And I've been with families that had to exhume the bones of their loved one a year later. I had to watch them look at the bones of their, their, their loved one. And if I'd asked, can these bones live? It would have been inappropriate, right? It would have been horrible because what would you say? What would I say? What does the prophet say? How does he respond to this problem of humanity? Certainly, death is a problem of all humanity that plagues as well the seed of Abraham. Can death be overcome with life? Can that thing that once was alive now is dead, that same thing now be alive again? From the very beginning of the whole story of the Bible, we see that humanity is plagued with a sin problem and the rebellion within Adam and Eve that was passed on to us in the fall, the consequences of that is death. No one escapes. And the Creator God, the Lord, the Sovereign Lord, asked His prophet in this encounter of the divine, can that which is dead become alive? And it's a question that I bring before you, for all of us who stood before a casket of a loved one, for all of us who have been to the gravesite. Can that body become alive? Well, the prophet humbly responds in a way that's appropriate. He says this, I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Now if you have an encounter with God Almighty, and it's as if His heavy hand was upon you, it was intense, and He's asking you, can these bones live? Probably the best thing to say is, I don't know, but surely you know Creator God. And this brings us now to our second encounter. In this second encounter, we're going to see in Ezekiel 37, 4 through 8, between the Son of Man, Ezekiel, and the dry bones. Up to now, he's just looked at them, but now he's going to interact with them. And the divine part of this encounter is he is going to speak the very Word of God. 
He will prophesy the promise of God. So in the first encounter, he probed the problem of death, and now he's going to prophesy the promise or the answer to it. And we see in Ezekiel 37, 4, he says this, Then he said to me, the Lord said to the prophet, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Now what is prophecy? Today in the churches you hear a lot about prophecy, but prophecy is actually foretelling the very word of God, okay? In this case, Ezekiel will proclaim God's promises as handed down to him right from God himself. And he will proclaim God's promises to the bones. Ezekiel 37 verses 5 and 6. This is the word of the Lord that he will proclaim. Now this is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. And I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Well, God's promise is that He Himself will resurrect the dry bones. This is a work of God. God has the authority, God has the power, and God has the will to raise the dead. Only God can give life, contrary to what you hear today, but only God gives life. And He will put the breath of life in His people. Now this was God's declaration. It was a declaration that the bones could never create life within themselves. Yet God calls the Son of Man, the Son of Adam, humankind, to partner with Himself. He will be the one to do it, but He invokes, He calls the prophet to be the speaker of His word and His will. God partners with mankind. He calls man to that representation of himself. And this is man's part of the work of revival. As the word of the Lord was proclaimed over them, they would receive God's promise, the breath. So let's see what actually happens, okay? Ezekiel 37, verses 7 and 8. What do you think happens? He says this, So I prophesied as I was commanded, and I was prophesying as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and bones came together, bone to bone. Now imagine this. You're in a huge valley. Some of you have been in Terrazopolis, Petropolis. There's some beautiful valleys, right? You have mountains on both sides. You look down through the valley. Imagine thousands upon thousands of bones. And what would you hear if... Upon the proclamation of God's word, all those bones came together, clicking into place. Wow, what a sound, what a rush as they snap together in place. Well, Ezekiel says, Then I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them. Skin covered them. Well, this is a graphic vision of undoing death, isn't it? How does death occur? Someone breathes their last. Wow, they're, they're gone. Then we lie them to rest, right? And what happens first? First, the skin and, 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 and the flesh and the sinew and the, the tendons begin to decay and dry up. And what's left? Bones. And then the bones dry and then the bones separate. And here what he sees is just the opposite. The bones come together, then the, 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 the connector parts, right, come, the sinew comes and they're connected, then the flesh comes and then the skin. They're, the death is undone. 
In this vision, Ezekiel prophesies the very word of God. Charles Spurgeon says this, if we want revivals, we must revive our reverence for the word of God. If we want conversions, we must put more of God's word into our sermons. Even if we paraphrase it into our own words, it must still be his word upon which we place our reliance for the only power which will bless men lies in his word. Psalm 19, 7 says this, the law, law of the Lord is perfect. And what does it do? Revives the soul. 2 Timothy 3, 16 says this, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, Training in righteousness that the man of God may be equipped completely for every good work. So we see the undoing of death happening by the proclamation of God's word. Bones snap together, tendons hold them in place, flesh appears, they're covered with skin, yet something is missing. What's missing? The breath. And verse 8 ends with these astonishing words. But, B-U-T, it's the biggest little word in your testimony. I once was, but I met Christ, and now. And here we see the evangelist, the prophet speaking the word of God. Stuff happens, it's noisy, things are going on, they're godly things. But even after preaching the word of God, there is no breath. There is no life. But there was no breath in them. Is not the word of God sufficient? Isn't that what we just said? What is missing? That brings us to our third encounter, Ezekiel 37, 9 through 14. We're just going to read two of those verses, I believe. Between the encounter between the Son of Man and now the Holy Spirit, which is the power of God's promise. So we saw the probe of the problem, the question of death and life. Then we saw the promise, right? Prophesied, which is the word of God. And now we're going to see the power of that promise. Ezekiel 37, 9 says this. Then the Lord said to me, prophesy to the breast. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, breath, from the four winds, and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life, and they stood up on their feet, a vast army. David Guzig in the Enduring Word Commentary, it's an online commentary I like to, to read. He says that life would be marked by breath once living again in these bones. Now this has double meaning, the breath, because we know that the Hebrew word for breath is also wind and it's also spirit. I don't have a hotel, I, I don't have a tattoo, I don't have a piercing, but if I ever had one, I'm always, I, I like the Hebrew letters for ruah, hua. It's the, it's the breath of God. It's the wind. It's the spirit, the Holy Spirit. Remember the encounter of Jesus and Nicodemus the religious leader, and Nicodemus was wondering what he needed to do to, to be saved, to enter the kingdom, and what did Jesus tell him? You must be born again, recreated. And Nicodemus, kind of like this, 
dry bones, baby. Like, hey, I was born once. So you made to crawl back into my mama's womb. And he says, how are you a leader so, so ignorant to the things of God? And he says, no, when you're born by water, you must also be born by the Spirit, the Ruah. And he said, it's like the wind, the Ruah. You look out, you don't know where it's coming from, you don't know where it's going, but you see the trees and you hear the noise, and it's present. And this is how life from death works as the sovereign Lord sends out his breath. This was previously promised in Ezekiel 36, the chapter before. God said, I will give you a new heart, a new spirit, and I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. What is the secret of obeying the word of God? The presence of the spirit, the Ruah. What is the secret to life that we said in the beginning of the service that you repeated? The presence of God is the secret to life. And that's the Ruah, the spirit poured out in this new covenant. 17th century theologian Jeremy Taylor points out about Ezekiel's encounter with the Holy Spirit. He says this, that this action was equal to praying. As Ezekiel besought the Spirit of God to effect the miracle of recreation, breath come. To breathe into man's nostrils the breath of life, this time the effect was devastating. What preaching by itself failed to achieve, prayer made a reality. Charles Spurgeon says, first the prophet prophesies to the bones, here is preaching. And next, he prophesies to the four winds. The breath, the spirit, come, this is prayer. The preaching has its share in the work, but it's the praying in the spirit which achieves the result. For after he had prophesied to the four winds, and not before, the, bo the bones began to live. As a pastor these last years, how have I taught you to pray, church? How have I taught you to pray? And continue to plead for you pray. Pray with the scriptures in one hand, on your knees, pleading the promises of God through the power of the Spirit. As we see here, God will respond to His own word. David Bakke, former prayer leader of Reach Global, my mission, he said this many years ago, I heard him say this, preaching about this text. It takes a person of integrity to preach the word of God, does it not? But who is it that can prophesy to the Spirit, come? And the Spirit comes. Well, this reality is that this text is more about the restoration of the people of Israel, both physically and spiritually, than the teaching of the resurrection that's yet to come. But, I want to show you this. Just like a cord seems like it has one, one strand, right? Most have multiple strands that are wrapped. 
And in the Old Testament, when we look at the Old Testament narratives, there is the story of the individual, Ezekiel, that we can learn from. But God is doing something bigger here. He's teaching about the people of Israel, His faithful remnant. And in the New Testament, the church, the people of faith. But He also is sharing what's happening in His redemptive history, His story throughout the world and all the kingdoms. So what can we learn from Ezekiel and his encounters, his three encounters? Well, first, hope. This is a story of hope. The weeping prophet Jeremiah talked about this new covenant. Ezekiel, in the midst of captivity, in the midst of dead man's bones, he sees hope because he knows that God is a God of reversal. God will reverse death. David Guzik suggests we can learn from the text how God works in revival and how God's servants should think and act relevant to such mighty working of the Spirit. If you and I, we put ourselves in the place of the prophet, not that it's a one-to-one a -one ratio, but in the new covenant in Christ, we are not only called to Christ, to gather, but we're also called to go and be ambassadors of the good news. God's servant, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, as your Lord, must know that the bones are dead and dry. People are without Christ, are dead. And God's servant must walk among the dead. Church is a good place to come, but you can't stay here. We gather to worship, we gather to train, to learn the scriptures, but we leave out amongst the bones to proclaim hope. Amongst the dead. God's servant must proclaim God's word. The powers in the word. God's servant must have almost a foolish confidence in God's word. Can these bones live? And it's a point of faith that we share Christ in the midst of situations that we think God could never change. God's servant must understand that the Spirit works in process. You don't come to know the Lord and change totally. You don't reach maturity. It's a lifelong, life on life, all of life process. Little by little you become by the power of the Spirit like Christ. God's servant must recognize that the work of the Holy Spirit is essential. God's servant must boldly pray for the Spirit to move. The Word and prayer together. God's servant must speak in the power of faith. God's servant must notice every evidence of the Spirit's work. Though there was not life in the, in the bodies, the prophet didn't give up, but he noticed that God was at work and it gave him boldness to prophesy to the winds. And God's servant must look for God's people to be revived into an army of service. You're called into light from the dark, and then you're sent back out to the dark. Here we're an oasis for people who are alone. And yet after hearing the word, after spending time together, caring for one another, we send you out as a launch pad of hope. God's servant must not say that hope is lost. One of our key values at the Union Church, and it's right here on our four values, is Christ centered, which is word driven and spirit led. Whenever you have the word of God, you must have the spirit of God to complete its work. We're word driven, but we're controlled by the spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness. 
self-control. Well, that brings us to this table. We're going to have our time of communion together. Not only do we see the prophets of Ezekiel time declaring God's word about a new spirit and a new life, but God through his prophet reveals a new and better covenant. And that's what this table represents, a new and better covenant, better than the law of Moses. The law of Moses, the, the righteousness was attained by regularly killing animals that never changed the heart. But in the new covenant, the servant, the suffering servant of the Lord, who we know now as Jesus, died once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit, the Ruah. We saw last week the suffering servant. If you missed that sermon, see Sam Sawyer's sermon on uh, YouTube. The suffering servant, the seed of David, Jesus Christ. And this week we see the prophets revealing the new covenant between God and his people, not only for the sacrifice of sin that leads to forgiveness, but that leads to everlasting life. Romans 8 says this, kind of a New Testament commentary on what I just shared with you from the Old Testament prophets. Romans 8, 9 and 11. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. Now if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, the presence of God is what? Life. And how do we come to the table? How do we come to the new covenant? How do we come to be immersed by the Spirit? Repentance and belief. No other way. Dying to self and living for the Lord. Now if you received Christ both as Lord and Savior, I invite you to come, visit or not, to, to, to join us at the table. As Savior, you have come to Jesus as the only one worthy of forgiving your sins. Because he who was righteous became sin. Cursed is he who dies on the cross, he was cursed. So we who were cursed and forced to the grave, dead, would become the righteousness of God. It was a substitution once for all. Wow, good news. We come to Him as Savior, one who can forgive our sins, and leader, the one who will willingly obey and gives us that life. Each of you should evaluate your own life before coming to the table. Not only by your profession to be a Christian, not only by your profession to have Jesus received Him as Lord and Savior, but by the evidence of the Holy Spirit indwelling you. Which means that you not only have union and peace with God, but that you have union and peace with one another, your brothers and sisters in Christ. This is the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the symbol of the loaf, 
Though we are many in Christ, we are one. Evidence of the Holy Spirit. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he gave thanks. And he broke it. And he said to his disciples, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat of it. And do it in remembrance of me. But then he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them. Saying, drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many. The forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. I'd ask the elders to come, the elders to come forward and pass out the elements. And please hold the elements until everyone has received them. And we will, um, I will lead you in taking of the bread and of the cup. And on that night, just before Jesus was betrayed and then crucified the following days, Jesus took the bread and he gave thanks to the Father and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Take, eat of it in remembrance of me. Take and eat of the body.
And then after the meal, he took the cup and he said, this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant, the better sacrifice once and for all, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink of it. And when you do, do it in memory. close our service with the worship by tithes and offerings. And if you're a visitor here today, we don't oblige anyone to give money to the Union Church. That's not what that's about. But if you're a regular attender or a member of our church, we know the generosity of God that made Christ who was rich to become poor for our sake. He who was righteous to become sin for us. He who was high became low 
Now, Ebenezer Scrooge was a made-up story, and he who was miserly became generous because of the visit of three ghosts. If that happened in the story and touches hearts, imagine those of us who know Christ and the reality of the Almighty pouring out His Holy Spirit, that we might have the presence of God, that we might live in the presence of God and have life. Let us give today uh, generously out of the first fruits that we've already received from the Lord. Saving grace, you reign for. 
for your goodness, for you truly are the Prince of Peace. You are the King of Kings, and you have brought us into that. Not only have you saved us, but you have called us in as your representative, as your ambassadors on this earth of goodwill and favor, pronouncing the good news. We give you thanks. Lord, would you take these offerings, would you multiply them so that good news may go forth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to send you out this morning with the benediction and also invite you right afterwards over here to the fellowship hall we'll have a time of refreshment getting to know one another and catching up if you already know one another um, from the book of hebrews now may the god of peace who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our lord jesus the great shepherd of the sheep equip you with every good thing for doing his will and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through jesus christ to him be glory forever and ever amen church go in hope go in peace